It's my distinct pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker. I'm delighted to welcome back to Fairleigh Dickinson University, one of our own. Angeliki Fangu, a proud alumna of Fairleigh Dickinson University, was leading the charge of a younger generation of Greek shipping entrepreneurs. Her story is a fascinating one a fantastic one, grounded in Greek tradition. She's the fifth generation of a Greek shipping family, but is also following the modern script in rapidly changing, in a rapidly changing and booming industry. Today, Analika is chair and CEO of the Navias group of companies, one of the leading global brands in seaborne shipping. This latest chapter of her business career began in 2004, when, according to the New, York, the New York Times, she raised, quote, three quarters of a billion dollars from banks and investors and went out shopping for a big fleet of ocean-going ships, end quote. The next year, she brought Navias Maritime Holdings, one of the most respected names in shipping, for $600 million dollars. And that was just the first of a series of acquisitions that built the Navias Group into the dominant presence it is today. Before, before acquiring Navias, she, found, she was the founder and chief executive officer of Maritime Enterprises Management SA, a company based in Piraeus, Greece, that specialized in the management of dry cargo vessels. Much of Ankaliki's success can be attributed to her unusually strong background in both the technical and financial aspects of her business. By the way, I can say that we enjoyed a very spirited conversation about her interest in math. At FDU, she graduated summa cum laude with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and went on to get a master's degree in that same discipline at Columbia University. But she also has Wall Street in her background. She was an analyst on the trading floor of Republic National Bank of New York in the late 1980s and has served on or chaired the board of directors of two banks, including the second largest retail bank in Greece. It's my pleasure distinct honor to welcome back to Fairleigh Dickinson, Anneliki Frangu. Good evening and thank you very much for the warm welcome in back in the, this, my university. Guys, it was not long, long ago that I was sitting where you're sitting. To me, it looks like it was only yesterday, but it has passed, I think, 25 years from that time. And I'd like to share with you some uh, thoughts uh, of my personal journey, how I went from where you're sitting to where I am today. If I had to offer a single piece of advice and stop there, which you all have loved, guys, uh, I will say, chase your passions. That is rule number one, number two, and even number three as well. I cannot tell you that all our lives and your lives will be much better if we devoted our lives to what we love. Let's not forget that um, it doesn't matter if it's poetry, if it's math, if it's physics, if it's uh, physical education. Cultivated your passions, you will be a much happier person 
And don't forget that we spend sev over 70% of our life in our work. And the world will also be a much better place if we put our, all our dynamic uh, choices into that. I will share in a moment how chasing my passion uh, led me to, from where you are to where I am today. I, after all, I did not uh, decide to go and become a chairman and a CEO of a company, in a public company. Trust me, that was not my intention. Uh, even if I had that as a goal, I would not have been successful. Instead, I did things that I liked, like things that interest me. I kept my mind open and I followed to the opportunities and I st established my own business when I felt that I was ready. There is also another rule that I like to say, have a role, a role model. You have to have a person in your life where you see as a model and an inspiration. In my life, these people were my parents, my father and my mother. Captain Nicholas Frangos has long been an innovator and a visionary of the maritime industry. He taught me that ingenuity and healthy skepticism of conventional wisdom were building blocks for success. From my father, I learned that winning in business is not a byproduct of chasing, is not a, is not a byproduct of chasing success. It is all about making very fundamental decisions and sound decisions and maintaining your core values. My mother was also an inspiration to me. Uh, Stella Frangos was an, a pioneering person, a woman, and uh, when my father taught me about reality, my mother taught me about passion. And this accounts for my love for opera and antiquities and history. And this is things that she was also very unique, particularly in her time, because she accepted other people. She accepted uh, no matter their pedigree or their background. And this is something that she inspired to all her children. My father was coming from a shipping background, and he's a captain in a vessel, and his family was also in shipping. So anyone would have thought that this is a uh, for given, it was given that I will end up in this industry. To be honest, the reality is a little bit different. The reason I start having a passion is because during the weekends, my father will take me with him and I will visit a vessel in a shipyard. And there he will start talking to me about, uh, uh, and not only to me, but he'll have all his engineers and will be talking about a problem and how to solve it. So what really drove me is that I loved math. I know that a lot of you, you don't like it, but trust me, guys, it's a very easy discipline. You need math. You just need to follow it. So my love for math and um, my, my love on solving problems, and it, I ended up with engineering and mechanical engineering. So what you do really is, in, with the engineering, you like to solve problems. You have to, you, if you have the, what is the set of rules, what you need, you know that you will always find not only one solution, but multiple solutions. And I can say that I was very lucky because from an early age, I knew that I wanted to solve technical, uh, that I want to be an engineer and I like to solve technical problems. I also was very fortunate that I visited the United States when I was you know, 12, 15 years old on vacation with my family. And I realized this is the country I love to come and study. Uh, I don't know how many of you have lived outside the US or you have traveled outside the US. This country is a unique country. It's a melting pot. It doesn't matter your religion, your age, your gender, uh, your background. You, are, you can, if you like, you can become a part of this country. And this is unique. Even in countries like uh, UK, which is Anglo-Saxon, uh, speaks English, if you have an accent, you will always be a foreigner. This country allows you to be, to be part of this. And I think this education and uh, socialization in my, in, in my early career in the US, it is the reason 
that they played a, a large relation to my success. And I also develop a very American tendency of looking on the marriage of an argument and on opportunity. The United States is a country where it's a meritocracy. It doesn't matter who is the person. It's about the ideas. And if there is marriage to these ideas, you can, and you work for that, you can achieve anything. This is a very, very unique country. And indeed, as a result of, of that, today I have a company that we have men and women from every country of the world, every religion, uh, every background. And we are very strong because we have this diversity. Looking back to my four years in uh, Fairleigh Dickinson, I think it was one of the wonderful times I had. I have friends from uh, the school, I can say in the engineering, we were only three girls, I have to admit that, uh, that I keep uh, from that time. And what you enjoy here is you have a suburban life, you have a, the campus life, and at the same time, at night, you can be in the greatest city of the world. Of course, you have to make sure you study. Uh, and I enjoyed engineering here. Uh, and after graduating, I mechanical, I went to Columbia University. Uh, as you realize, I never wanted to go away from the city. So I remained here. And graduating engineering, then I went to the financial engineering, because after all, you need that. And I started my career in... Uh, uh, in a trading floor of a bank here in New York, understanding how the markets work. Because it doesn't matter if you will graduate engineering, you can end up managing companies or you can do totally different things. It's a discipline that you finish. It's a way of thinking. What you have to do is enjoy what you do afterwards. Uh, so in the early 90s, I started uh, a company with uh, an investment. Uh, and I built my own company from one vessel to, in 15 years, to about 100 million in net asset value and 17 vessels. In 2003, I realized the world was changing. You know, our business shipping is capital intensive. And I saw a basic a beginning of a change. China, a very populous country of a billion six, think about is. A, is about five United States in size, of, not in size uh, uh, population-wise. So this country was, because Clinton admitted it in the WTO, uh, the, it became part of our, of our economic world. These people will have to be fed, and they had to have the roads, and they had to have infrastructure development, meaning uh, steel, wood, uh, you needed uh, corn, you needed soya beans. So, there was a, a very big change that was happening. So you needed, in a capital intensive business, you need capital, and the best place is US capital markets, is the financial markets. But at that time, there was, no, uh, there was not even one company in the dry bulk in the US. And also, it's always important to be, go very quickly. So what I did is uh, I, I was, came across a very unknown structure was called SPAC. At that time, there was 11 companies, 11 SPACs. The larger one was 40 million. Any advisor that I had financial, they were thinking I was lunatic, and it was a, a stupid way to pursue it. But I saw it was not a lot of money, and it was only my energy that I had to put. And I thought that that was the best structure to go, as you raise the money, you co-invest it with your investor, so you didn't have the valuation pro considerations, and you could go and buy whatever was best uh, for all of us. Instead of, uh, I think, the mo let's say you go and buy a house. If you don't have the money, you cannot negotiate very well with a, with a, with a seller. It's much better if you have the money. It's easy. So to, to me, it was very logical. So I, I pursued this, and I start going around the United States for over a month, in a roadshow, explaining what is shipping. I had to draw, you know, pictures, and I had to explain what we carry. And I had to say, guys, anything in this building, we carry. The cement, the steel, the wood, everything you eat, we carry. And uh, you explain these things is very important, because 
This is a vast country and everything, everyone thinks that everything, everything comes from a grocery. They come from a far away. Take the coal, like now Japan, you have, a, uh, you have now the nuclear uh, problem in crisis in Japan. They will need coal for energy. This is what we carry. So I had to explain all this and manage very quickly, uh, managed to raise 200 million. That was a, an unheard of amount. And from that time, SPAC became an asset class. Now there is like a billion dollar market. And that's how we became uh, public. And from the, that one company, we now have the, with that money, we acquired Navios, which was, uh, in, it was created in the 1950s as a whole owned subsidiary of US Steel for the transportation of ore. So that company, with the reverse merger, we made it public. And we now have built a group of three publicly listed companies in the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, we control about 100 vessels, one of the largest fleets in every direction. The way we built this company is because I was surrounded with excellent minds from all around the world. Because it is not about the steel, it's not about the, the walls. You need people and you need thinking people. You have to make decisions when you buy or you sell or how you repair or how you go to the next port or what will be the opportunity. So you need to build a team. We are as good as our team. And that's how we build it. And I will have to say one more thing. I like to say that sometimes in leadership, you have to make difficult decisions. And you may be making decisions that people don't like it. They may take a long time to understand what you did, or they may scream at you, but you have to make decisions, and you should know why you did it. I remember, you know, our market, like uh, in 2007 and 8, was very strong. So people and ship owners went and bought vessels, like they bought houses here, and they thought that the house will ever, the price will go forever up. So instead of renting them out and making sure that you can pay your mortgage, they said, no, 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 we'll leave them spot. We'll not fix them and make sure that, and then they thought that the price will go forever up. Instead of realizing that you have a liability, you have to pay someone. Now we follow common sense and we went when it was very nice contracts and we fixed our vessels for five and 10 years. So we had visibility. I mean, there was very nice margins, and we thought, this is the correct thing. So I remember that I was having conference call with the investors in the first quarter of 2008 and the second, and everyone was uh, screaming that uh, we are too conservative and we don't make enough money for the investors. And then all of a sudden, there was a financial crisis and a collapse, and the market dropped by 95%. You know, it dropped severely. So a lot of the other companies had to go to bankruptcy. They had to go, the majority of them, they had to go to their banks and ask for renegotiation. We review our company, we sat down, we review and said, we are absolutely okay. We can pay our dividends to our shareholders. We can cont continue pay our banks. And also we were very strong and we could make a lot of investments in the law of the market. So. In the fourth quarter, the same people that were screaming at me in the, in the beginning of the year, they were telling me, you are the best person in the world. <laughs> so you realize that you have to make the decisions for what they are. And the last thing, I mean, is really for any leader, you have to make sure you rely on your people and you have to educate. One of the things we have to educate is shipping is a young industry in the capital markets, is, has a long history in, from a, ancient times in, in the world, but in the market, in the capital markets, is young. So we have to educate our investors that they have to trust the management and you really have to invest as in any business, in the law of the cycle. You don't have to buy when everything goes up. I mean, that is a hurt mentality. You really have to trust the management and buy on the law of the market where the opportunities come. But this also, this is really making people to trust you that you, to entrust you with their money and to understand that you're not gonna do uh, stupid decisions, but you will really grow 
and that will be the long-term success. I think I just wanted to share some of uh, my experiences and uh, thank you very much for listening. You're very quiet, you're very good students, guys. And we can open these two questions if you have any. I'll start off with a macro question. The Greek financial crisis, how have you been navigating that and what do you see in the future? The financial crisis in Greece is not important for shipping per se because we're a global business. We are affected not from one country, but every country and everything. But the Greek crisis is important because it is really a sovereignty, it's not a sovereignty risk of Europe, of three, four countries, but it's a, a credit crisis. In Europe, unlike the US, they did not do a stress test that really cleared and closed the case. As you know, we have another uh, banking, uh, we will have a, a stress test for the banks in June. And until we persuade the market that this is reality and the results are good, you have that the, the banks are really struggled, they cannot lend, and you have a problem because in our business, it's a capital intensive business, you need to have banks and all the financing is from Euro European banks, German, uh, Nor uh, Nor uh, Scandinavian, and British banks in France. You studied and you worked in a very male-dominated industry. There's a lot of young girls out here who will probably have better numbers, probably more girls are going to be studying math and engineering, but what are some of the challenges that you faced you know, in a, in a male-dominated industry, both mechanical engineering and shipping? Guys, we're in the 21st century, century. We have passed the 20th century. Gender is not important. It's all about your achievements, what you will do. What you need is to, in our company, we have engineers in our technical department. It doesn't matter. It's what you do, and you have to have courage and dedication to what you do. It doesn't matter anymore. You have, I mean, the world has changed. You have. Obama is your president. Come on, guys. Something has changed. What do you imagine you would do if you weren't running a shipping company? Most probably I'll uh, be either in the financial world or uh, I, I think I will have done my own company because I feel confident and I don't mind the responsibility. Because running a company means that uh, you will have hundreds of people relying on you. So your one bad decision means somebody is losing not only you, but a lot of other people who lose their jobs and their families. But I don't mind that responsibility. I think I would have run some kind of a company, most probably. How is your company dealing with the increased threat of piracy off the coast of Africa? This is a very big problem. Because in essence, uh, guys, how many of you know geography? We are talking about piracy is in Indian Ocean. And what has happened really, because there is not, uh, they have not found a regulatory way where to bring these pirates for, to justice. They leave them out in the, and now they have occupied the entire Indian Ocean. They have machine guns, they have uh, bazookas, they don't care about lives, and they can easy, uh, vessel is unarmed people, so it's very easy to take them. So what it does, it creates a taxation to everyone, because as you give these ransoms, they stop you, you have to pay ransom to release the vessel and the crew, and this is in essence passed through to everyone. We have to do something, because in essence that will create a taxation to international trade. Nothing is done. I think there's too many other problems right now. Nobody's focusing on that. But it's a big problem. Who, who is your biggest competitor? Uh, ship, shipping, uh, you will never com You have a lot of companies. You have, uh, we have about, f there's about 45 companies in the world that they have the size we have. Mm -hmm. 
And then you have a lot of small owners, etc. So you will have um, Michui, which is a major Japanese company. You have uh, Costco, which is a major Chinese. You have um, Hanjin, which is Korean. But you know, is, some of them are also backed by governments. In the U.S. capital markets, we are one of the leading ones, independent. One more question. Given what's going on in the world right now with the U.S.'s recovering economy and the crisis in Japan, what are your plans for your company? I think what we did is that um, in the past years, we strengthened our balance sheet. We repaid debt. We have a very good cash generation. And as we know that a lot of the European banks have problems, we know that some of the portfolios have to be sold. We like to take this opportunity to invest in this, this, this cycle as we see that eventually the U.S. is really recovering. Emerging markets are doing very well. And it's only the question mark of Europe when it will come with some lag coming out of the crisis. So, yes, we, like, we think there will be opportunities to invest. Um, I have to say that your story is uh, very remarkable and um, inspiring. And I'm curious for all the young folks sitting here, um, it almost sounds kind of like a movie, um, you know, as we go through. And what, we, what you haven't touched on is, can you talk maybe a little bit about uh, some type of inflection point, um, some type of uh, difficult decision? Because I think um, you seem very confident. And I think for all the folks here um, where it's new and, you know, challenges have to be overcome, Maybe you can talk a little bit about one challenge that was very uh, difficult and how you overcame it as to continue on with your success. First of all, when I had my first vessels, my biggest fear was that in the middle of the night they will call me and there will be an event where I have to make a decision and there will not be anyone around me. And you have, because don't forget when you are ashore in the land, you can have a much Sometimes people in the bad weather or with a technical problem, and as you know, things happen in the worst possible moment, as Murphy's laws will tell you, you may, they, they cannot see it as rational. So my, always I had the fear that I will have to do the same thing. Because I remember as a child, my father, they were calling in the middle of the night with an accident, and my father was talking. And, and eventually that happened. It happened that the vessel had a, an accident where it lost its propeller and they called me. And I had to make, to be calm, give the correct advice, because this is moments where you cannot play with the life of a person. So you have to make a decision. It's not about, you don't know. In a hindsight, everyone has 20 to 20 vision. You never have this luxury of the hindsight, but you have to think, be calm, listen, and analyze the problem. This is the only advice I can say. This happens, and you, you will have it all in your life in different ways. And in every different phase of your life will be different the challenges. In the beginning is the technical problem. Then you may have a financial collapse, or you have, you have to deal. And don't forget the problems come in different forms. Our industry is affected from everything from uh, floods in Australia, from uh, uh, earthquakes, earthquakes in Japan. Uh, we are affected from the change in democracy in, uh, around the Arab world. Anything affects us. The commodity prices, the piracy, everything, and nothing. So you have to concentrate on trying to identify risk and to think, use common sense, basically, in making decisions. Okay, well, thank you very much, Angelique.